The Skeptic Zone is brought to you by Dr. Bob's Trivia Quiz. Visit drbobsquiz.wordpress.com and see if you can match wits with Dr. Bob. Welcome to The Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Hello and welcome to The Skeptic Zone, episode number 322. Merry Christmas. Coming up on this week's episode, it's a Maynard. Maynard chatting to, well, one of my favourite people in the world. What a, what a man, what a talent. What a good sceptic he is, George Shrub. A writer of one of my favourite songs, Far. You ponder the universe and a look comes across your face. You try to fathom distances of all the stuff in space. But you can't wrap the bacon of your mind around the big. Of all the terms required to describe how big he is. Oh, yes, that's a good song. Oh. Maynard caught up with uh, Geo, George Rubb, at the uh, Australian Skeptics Convention just a couple of weeks ago. And what an interesting interview he has. In fact, uh, I feel quite guilty because towards the end of the interview, I had to come into the room and give them the wind-up because the, the room was shutting, the venue was shutting. Uh, I could have, and I should have maybe, let them chat on for longer. Coming up, Maynard interviews George Rubb, and then following that... Maynard quickly catches up with uh, oh, a very famous man in Australia, Dick Smith. And Australians certainly know who I'm talking about. Uh, Dick Smith is one of the founders of Australian Skeptics. He was at the convention too, and uh, Dick's going to chat to Maynard about his views on population. Dick Smith's views on population coming up after a chat with uh, George Shrub. Following that, it's a week in science from the Royal Institution of Australia, www.riaus.org. Dot au. Hello to all those wonderful people at the Royal Institution of Australia in the beautiful city of Adelaide. So glad I was able to visit not long ago. And then it's Evidence Please with Joe Alabaster and a slightly more jazzy theme. Yeah, have a listen for that. I've jazzed it up a little bit. This week, Joe continues her review, re- retrospective, analysis, report, thoughts on the Australian Skeptics National Convention. Great convention. Really had a good time there. In other news, the DVD of the Vaccination Chronicles is now available if you visit www.skepticzone.tv. Here's the deal, folks. Here's the deal. If you want to buy a copy of the Vaccination Chronicles, it'll cost you 12 bucks, 12 Australian dollars. I'll mail that out to you, and I'll sign that. But here's the deal. In buying that, what you're really doing is helping me to cover lots of costs involved in putting that all together. And then it's up to you to please copy that DVD and pass it along to friends who should also copy it and pass it along and copy it and pass it along. The artwork for the DVD is on the DVD itself. So if you put it into your computer and just look at the directory, you'll find the artwork for the cover and the the disc itself, if you want to print out that artwork. It might look good. But that's the deal. If you want to buy a copy of the Vaccination Chronicles, which includes extra interviews, some other uh, features, uh, historical features from the 50s, which are quite interesting, newspaper clippings as well, the uh, languages, the subtitles on the DVD are many and varied, from Russian to Turkish to uh, what else is on there? I think uh, Dutch is on there, all sorts of things. That's the deal. So visit www.skepticzone.tv if you want to buy a copy. I'll send it to you. Uh, your money helps cover costs. And then you'll have a copy to copy yourself and distribute as you see fit. I think that would be really great. Also, if you want to help the Skeptic Zone podcast, I've just put a couple of things up for bid on eBay, and the link will be at skepticzone.tv in the show notes for this episode. Uh, A signed origami flapping bird made by me, signed by myself and James Randi, together with a tour card from the recent James Randi, an evening of James Randi tour here in Australia, a tour card signed by Randi himself and me. Uh, A couple of souvenirs from the uh, the tour that's just gone. 
And uh, the money raised in that little auction certainly goes straight to helping this podcast keep on air or on the internet or in your ear, so to speak. And I wonder where you're listening to me right now. Are you on that train commuting to work or on the bus? Are you walking the dog? Are you walking the cat or goat? Are you doing the dishes, I wonder, or cleaning something? Are you in the garden? I wonder what you're doing. Whatever you're doing, I hope that the Skeptic Zone keeps you company for the next little while. And that gives us all a a nice feeling here at Skeptic Zone headquarters, I can tell you. But now it's time for me to run downstairs. Make a nice toasted cheese sandwich. Oh, yeah. Swiss cheese, maybe. Oh, Swiss cheese toasted sandwich. And if you're in Australia, you can add a bit of Vegemite to that. Ooh, what a good combination. Hmm. Well, I do that. I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Here's Maynard's spooky action at a distance. Look, when the call went out from the Australian government to get a man to this country that no, could, no, 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 that no, could no, 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 pick no, 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 a core anglais no, no, no. from a French horn <laughs> from a kilometre away, yes. they called George Rapp. Oh, here I am, here I am. We always are chatting at the end of these these marathon <laughs> these marathon weekends. I love it. You get me all giddy and wonked out. So Look, it's the last time we spoke was at the end of Tam. What do you get at the end of these things? I, I got a nice bottle of wine, which apparently is some is some big to do. There's some local v- vine merchant. What Whatever the, whatever the term is, I don't even know what it is here. Grog Shop. Grog Shop, I guess, who has it signed by Mr. Grog himself. <laughs> and a couple of CDs. Maybe actually you could help me uh, yeah, you discern here. what this is. We've got Jeffrey Gurumal Yungipu, Yungpingu. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Some, oh, yeah. Nice. yeah, good indigenous music. Nice. Yeah. And then uh, Bird Song and Dust, William Barton, oh, yes, some yes. more indigenous stuff. Mm-hmm. And then Yothi Yundi. Yeah, yeah. Cl- classic indigenous stuff. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so this is, this is the real deal. This yeah. is, uh, well, they're, okay. They're all pretty good there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Actually, yeah. actually, someone on my Facebook page was asking me about combinations of, of didgeridoo with bagpipes. Yes. It's been done. Yes. Uh, techno didgeridoo, it's been done. In fact, we couldn't find any style. The only thing we couldn't find was Christmas music done with a didgeridoo. <laughs> That's how <laughs> It, it's it's sort of eulogish. You would think that that would work, mm. maybe. Yeah, I That's don't true. know. <laughs> Look, and of course, we'll have to do a bit with you for the Christmas show in a moment because uh, being in Bethlehem, it's coming up to your favorite time of year or second favorite. You're a bit of a Thanksgiving guy, aren't you? Uh, Thanksgiving is my favorite. Thanksgiving, because of its lack of any kind of religious baggage, Thanksgiving is nice. Thanksgiving is food, mm. food and family. So that's that I enjoy. Christmas, however, is more all engulfing and it's more of a season. So so the build up to it, I am I am one of those people that really likes the delayed gratification. Mm. I eat the veggies first and have the steak last on the plate. Yes. So, yeah, yes. you know? Mm. Um, so Christmas is kind of this lovely buildup. I don't mind the kind of pre-Christmas build that happens because you sort of delay, you delay, you delay. And then uh, and then Christmas itself comes. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's you know, it's its own fun. But to me, the, the anticipation is... I'm learning that as I get older. The anticipation is almost more fun than the actual thing. Yeah, it's a, it's, that's a bad thing, but I don't think so. I don't think so. I think what it does is it allows you to move forward so that you, 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 you get to the thing and it's as good or maybe not as good as the anticipation. And then you plan the next thing. And it's in the doing and the preparing and the thinking about that the juices start flowing and it gets really fun, I think. Hmm. This weekend you gave a chat about, uh, from an atheist perspective, talking about loss and grief and, and letting go. How do you think that went? I, the response was actually really nice. Yeah, it's it's one of these subjects, like I said in the talk, that whenever I do bring it up, uh, this community gets gets pretty responsive about it. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. and it's not something that is talked about that often in these kinds of settings. You know, in conference settings, skeptical conference settings, science settings, there's so much interesting stuff to talk about, empirical stuff to talk mm-hmm. about. Uh, and yet, you know, everyone deals with relationships and emotions and loss and love and all those things and it's a much less empirical 
subject. So I don't know if it gets glossed over or if it's just something that doesn't necessarily traditionally fit within the criteria of this kind of a setting. But boy, it, it touches a nerve. And person after person after person came up to me and said that, you know, it's something they've they've talked about with family members that are believers or friends that are believers. And it's a, it's a difficult subject. One woman, you know, came up and her husband died October 28th just recently Mm -hmm. and her father died a week after that or something and she was she was you know we both just held each other and just cried and it struck me like if anyone on the outside looking in uh, can or would would dare to assume what would be happening at a skeptic convention i don't think they would think that kind of a thing would be happening which i said don't ever let anyone say that skeptics are cold or that science scientists people that are you know users of critical thinking empiricists can be cold can be heartless here we are two strangers in essence you know bonding over this idea of loss and how final and horrible loss is and and how we need to in a strange way embrace that and not imagine some kind of eternal afterlife or some kind of next part to this existence what about, and I've heard you talk about this on your podcast, the more petty things, like there's a small thing, you'd like your, guitar, your favourite guitar pick gets lost, the jeans that you like are no longer wearable, you can't fit those favourite shoes you've been wearing for years that will niggle at you. How can you get rid of that niggling so you aren't like a crappy person for a couple of hours? What on the smaller scale can oh we do? Gosh, yeah, that's a great question. That's yeah. a, and that's because one of those... The, the, those big ones are definitely the cosmic ones yeah. you need talking about, but those small ones can make you a bad person for a couple of hours. Interesting, yeah. And it's funny how much value we play into items, into things, uh, even even skeptics, even people that are, like I said, complete empiricists. I mean, I went and saw a Darwin exhibit, and I got chills when I saw his magnifying glass. It was at the in New York at the Museum of Natural History, and the entire exhibit starts with his magnifying glass. And, you know, part of me says, there is no connection between this piece of metal and glass mm-hmm. and Darwin. There's no... There's no you know, maybe there's a slight, a couple molecules, maybe, but probably not a hundred years later. There's no way, and yet it was as close to sort of magic and a a relic that that I could get. You know, because he held it. The idea he held it. So yeah, that that favorite guitar yeah. pick. Okay, why is it the favorite guitar pick? Yeah. And 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 who gives a shit ultimately when when it goes missing? But yeah. but you do. Is it because we are searching for consistency and meaning and uh, maybe it's the consistency thing. I'm a, I'm a guy who's really big into, you know, uh, uh, consistency. You know, knowing knowing the things that provide comfort for me, mm. recreating those. It, they can be lovely because they provide comfort, but at the same time, you can get stuck in a rut. You know, yeah. and that can be uh, not as inspiring, maybe as 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 pulling yourself out of a rut. You know, hopping on a plane and going to Australia can be really inspiring. I mean, mm-hmm. I had to, last night I had to write a song really quickly. Oh uh, yes, now I saw you doing that. Yeah. It was, I saw you tucked away in the corner, yeah. and I, I really wanted to go talk to you to get everyone to hear a little bit of what was going on in your head. But I also knew that you were under the gun to yeah. get it done. Yeah. So twenty minutes. To what do came it. first, chord structure or words? Words. The story. Okay. The sort of the idea. And I recorded a bit of it, and I've got to say, it didn't sound derivative at all. It sounded like a George, fresh George song. Oh, it did cool. not sound derivative of any of your influences at all. Okay. Oh, great. Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, I was hoping to tap into that uh, deadline, u- you know, uber deadline thing that mm. you have to finish this in 20 minutes, a half hour, whatever it is, or at least get close to being done or start something significant. And it seemed to work. So uh, the context is uh, one of the one of the bid one of the auction items was uh, I would write a song for an individual, for them about someone about someone they love about someone they hate whatever. Uh, so uh, one gentleman uh, bid on it, um, and I pulled him aside and just said we just started talking. I said, okay, you know, what do you do? He was then an anesthetist. I thought, okay, I'm, that might be something I could mind. Maybe I don't know. I heard he had an accent. I said, where are you from? He said, you know, uh, uh, Adelaide. I said, well, originally, where are you from? He said, Poland. I was like, oh, so when did you emigrate? So, oh, in 19, uh, 1986, my family uh, went on a trip to Italy and basically uh, uh, defected. Said we were going one place, went to another place, and escaped. And I said, okay, that's the song. That's I mean, here's the story. Now you are here, you know, uh, whatever, 20 years later. Plus, it's two years before the wall fell down. Mm-hmm. So you are risking your life. You know, your, your, your parents are risking the lives of their children, or, or at least, you know, the safety of their children, mm-hmm. where two years later, it wouldn't necessarily mean the same thing. Like, okay, 
yeah. that there's something there. And I sort of tried to mine that. So the idea of uh, no warning popped into my head. They left because I think he said, yeah, my parents just left. They got up, no warning, and they left. And I thought, no warning. All right, that's a cool title. And that became the title. And you just sort of go from there. And it's like, and you sort of grab on, put the skis on, and, and you're <laughs> behind the boat. And you're just, you know, you're, you're, you're being pulled by the boat of, of, uh, of, of songwriting, hopefully. It, it, it did, went really well. And look, just talking to you, the George Rabb I met at TAM, yeah. um, I've got to say I'm talking to an even more confident, a more happy inside himself George that I spoke to then. Not that I thought you were not happy in yourself, yeah. but no, you're just sitting here as confident as all hell and very everything's sitting well. Everything's running well. Everything, everything all the pistons are firing at the right time <laughs> and the carburetor's firing at the right height of that piston. Well, the, the, the facade is just that much more. <laughs> the facade is perfect. <laughs> facade, Whatever's going yeah. on in there, I don't care. The facade has got me it's completely a, fooled. It's a gesso, yes. This is a hardened gesso. Yeah, years of years of uh, patina on the outside is now, what it is. Of course, as hosting this whole thing this week, did you have any Kafka moments where like something was, well, hang on, this doesn't make any sense. What's going on here? Was uh, there any... Uh, occasionally, yeah, you'll hear a, a sort of applause happen. I'll be in the corner somewhere and you hear lar- large applause and you're trying to determine is that ending applause or is that appreciative applause of some moment that just happened and your heart skips for a second because you're not where you need to be or prepared. Um, that was it. I think that, that was about the only yeah, a couple, okay. a couple times that happened but there was no yeah there was no I, I, I have to say this was run exceptionally well mm-hmm. on every level just from the prep and the venue itself. I mean the AV there were no AV issues. I mean, normally it's just a wash in AV issues, something mm. like this, and it wasn't. It's yeah, wonderful. a slight echo problem with the Skeptics Guide on stage. Yeah, there was that. The, the venue was room is, acoustics. You room acoustics. Really, it's yeah. designed to be a, a performance space for music, I assume, and, and and not so much speaking. So when I first got here uh, Saturday morning, yesterday morning, gosh, it seems like a week ago. It's amazing, mm. the time dilation that the, happens. The, the amount you pack in there. Yeah, yeah. I got here Saturday morning, and I stood center stage with my guitar without any amplification whatsoever, played a chord, and it was beautiful. I thought, boy, I don't need anything in here. That, unfortunately, does not lend itself to sit you know, on a panel with six people and talk to each other and the audience at the same time. However, they did everything they possibly could to, to make everybody happy. They kept trying different things, and by the end, we sort of had it I cracked, or at least much better than it was initially. Let's talk about the closest thing to an incident that I've witnessed here, and I've been looking hard. In fact, I've been trying to start a few. Oh, how do I get the word controversial in front of my name? What's the quickest way to do that? I think, oh my God, do you want that? Why would you want that? Well, I don't know. Well, it would give me an extra name, you know, Maybe Controversial Maynard. Ask Rebecca if it's worth it, you know. Oh, okay. I mean, it's, it's lovely Rebecca will probably tell you that it's not, yeah, the, the, the whatever sort of press you might get from a con- controversial thing, I don't think it's quite necessarily personally worth it, and it's, well, it, there's a price that you pay for it. There's okay, a price well, that the, you pay. There, there was a moment, if I'd been in the room, I certainly would have intervened on Friday night where you had two drunken redhead girls that would, uh, it sounded like they almost spoiled the show and I and Richard came down and said oh these two girls want to meet you because I hadn't seen the show because the room was a bit crowded and I went up and I was just talking to them at the end I went oh hello you're from and then this woman came in out of nowhere said you two were uh, uh, selfish rude and horrible you ruined the show for lots of people and she just tore a bum all out of them yeah, yeah. yeah. well she was correct she, she was, was correct. she was correct and yeah. look and if they'd been doing that and I would have been up there I would have intervened sat down next to them and just told them quietly to, to do that, and but you, as, as someone on stage, there are ways that you can sort of hint, mm. and you hint more directly, and you hint more directly, and more directly, until I was I was literally yelling at them, sh- you know, shut up, stop talking, like you are ruining the show, sort of in a humorous way, yeah. but very loud, and it got a laugh, and and most people will get the clue. Yeah. Most people will get the clue. The problem was, it wasn't just that it was enthusiasm or excitement, we're doing a game show, and yeah. they're yelling out answers. Yeah. You know, a game show where there are contestants involved, yeah. and answers are being yelled out, you know, or uh, Evan uh, or Jay are trying to give their final closing thoughts that are the supposed to be a bit more of a serious mm. skeptical scientific thing like what do we do as skeptics the not the antithesis of the rest of the show but sort of the point of the show mm. and whooping and yelling and you see you know Evan being thrown for a second and, and being a trooper and, and muscling mm. through um, that to me is yeah I, I, I got very close to, yeah, to sort I'm, of saying you guys have to go I'm have sorry to go. I've been in the room I certainly, oh, I I certainly would have had a word to them but yeah because it's, just, it's, it's, a, it's very unusual of, it's unusual and there's a disbelief of like you really don't understand and then last night she came up and asked for a photo 
She came up and asked for a photo, and then I was sort of stuck in that place of, do I, for the first time ever, say no? No, I'm not taking a photo with you. She asked everyone, and I think uh, uh, Steve or whoever agreed to it before he realized who it was. Um, so we stood sort of as the SGU, took a photo with her, but I had my middle finger sort of subtly uh, exposed. So that made me feel good. I had a bit of a puss on my face, and my middle finger was shown. So if she does show the other people, at least, I mean, this is the only picture of its kind, so maybe mm. that was a weird thing, too, to give her something of, of, of weird value. Now, do you think it was the drunkenness that was the problem, was, or this yeah. person was not used to a live performance? A combination. I think it's a combination of excitement, which I understand. I know I've been to lots of shows where I'm excited, where uh, especially when I was younger, I would I would in my enthusiasm and excitement to let the person that's performing know that I am a fan of theirs. I've overstepped bounds. I've actually, I mean, I've apologized. Mike Keneally is a, is a big sort of hero of mine, a guitarist, Frank Zappa's guitarist. And as a 22-year-old, I was at a show of his once, and I was yelling things out to sort of say, I'm on the inside. Mm. I, I get what you do. I get it. Oh, here's a reference. Here's a reference. Here's a reference. And uh, what is it, 15 years later, uh, there was a, a podcast mm. where he was a guest and I was a guest, and I got to apologize. And I said, look, Mike, this has been bothering me for a long time. <laughs> I am sorry. I apologize to you and your family and any any loved ones that you might have now or in the future. I was I was a douchebag. And I, and I, but, so I understand the excitement. Um, once it's clamped down, though, usually people get it and they behave. Yeah. You know, this was just the alcohol then inhibits the clamping down mm. and it just, boy, it just exacerbates. So it makes her a memorable experience. And I, we will talk about her probably for the for the rest of our lives <laughs> as that one time. What was the worst you know, person in the audience? Mm. Oh, yes, it was this redhead in Sydney. All right. Well, look, I've got an important issue to deal out with you. It, it goes back many podcasts ago. You, you you gave a very hard time to male sex toys, particularly the Fleshlight. You were so, you were really wailing out on men that have fleshlights and why they have this thing that looks like a tennis ball container and that kind of thing. And I oh. thought, well, that's a bit sexist on your part. Why can't men have sex toys like women can have vibrators? Did I? I, th- I thought I thought the, the, the opening of a podcast. You were talking about being up late and seeing it as part of an infomercial. Yeah, no, no, no. I think the point of that rant wasn't the fact that the gentleman had the flashlight. The point of that rant was that the gentleman that had the flashlight that was posting videos of himself using it <laughs> had tan lines. Oh, oh so well, to, that's completely different. Yeah, I'm sorry. Me, it was fascinating that this guy who was completely willing to to post himself, you, you know, on the web, mm. humping this thing mm-hmm. uh, in public is modest and has to have t- has to cover <laughs> portion of you know it had like and it wasn't even like it was some kind of bikini tan line. There was like shorts tan line. I thought this guy is. Is modest. That was fascinating to me that he's modest mm. enough to wear something which will leave tan lines, but he's okay with humping this tube on the internet. That mm. to me, yeah, I I am all for personal uh, recreation, shall we say? And hey, whatever you want to do is totally fine. I've never I've never used a flashlight. I've heard good things. Um, to me, I think my my limitation of using something uh, like that any device that you use uh, is usually wonderful until you're done with it Hmm. there's that moment where you're done where you have to take the 3d glasses off and you go wow okay it's because even in the best of circumstances there is a bit of a denouement Hmm. you know at the the end and you realize (laughs) here i am again okay that's fine so when you add a device to it it adds a certain sort of sadness to to the overall experience (laughs) i don't think You've got to wash it out and hang it in the shower the there. And the hey, there's an octopus in the. Oh, no, sorry. Oh, it, it's that thing there. And look, let's talk a little bit more about Christmas. Is this the year the pantomime donkey and George goes to the Bethlehem Inn where you live and you ask them if there's any room? I, th- I think this should be the year. I think I think I should return from my trip here and, and finally do it. Finally get, get like the best, yeah, pantomime donkey. Mary combination outfit and go say, what do you mean there's no room? Yeah, well, I think Even if you animate it or you do <laughs> a recreation of it with it, as if it's a 70s, uh, like the odd couple thing or something, like fade the colour on the video oh, or something nice. and, and put the laugh track in. Yeah, I like I that idea. Okay, mm-hmm. we'll, get a, we'll get a co-producer credit for you for that. Yeah, mm-hmm. good. And of course, this is the moment where we reveal that actually George and I have a lot in common. We're both Volkswagen drivers. Oh, yes. Did you get your part? <laughs> yes, I did. I, I did get my part. I, I, you can't get the handle for a 2000 
thousand beetle if it snaps in your country unless you have to know a guy called Dave or something, I think. <laughs> yeah. So you got it? I got it, Because yes. I got this lovely email from you saying, if you don't mind, could you get this piece and bring it with you? And I was like, yeah, sure, fine. One day I went to close the door and right. all I got was the handle. Oh, wow. One of those ones, yeah. Okay, now you have the, the first iteration of the oh, new the, iteration? Yes, the Beetle okay. 2000 model, yeah. You like it? Yeah. You like it? I, I do like it a lot because I was original, a Beetle guy, but you're yeah. a Passat or a Golf guy? Oh, golf. Yeah, 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 golf. The the, the, the five-door, you know, the, the swing back. Uh, the, and, and did you pay the full money for the uh, defrost on the back windscreen when you bought the, when, I, you, when you replaced the glass? When I replaced the glass, I did not get the defrost on the back windscreen. Yes, yeah. and I should have because, boy, it makes a huge difference. But, yeah, when I smashed the back window accidentally while, while packing gear, they said, you know, it would be a significant amount more if you want the defrost thing. I thought, you know what, I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it. So, mm-hmm. so and you, yeah. there's a reason why they have a defroster. Oh, my gosh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, boy, the voodoo packing technology of that car is just amazing. You put the seats down, and I fit my drum set, my drum riser, our, our sub, our stands, all of our band swag, and a passenger seat is open. So it's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> look, uh, you've got to go. There's a lot of people that need to talk to you there. Just a few quick questions here. Um, look, we'll do it. It's a, okay, it's like a science or fiction, okay? Uh, the, 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 yeah. Yes, uh, I'm going to read you four porn titles. Uh, only one of them is not real, okay? These were nominated for AVN Award. Okay, these are nominated for AVN. Okay, we've got Iron Man, Medieval Head, Man of Steel, Justin Beaver Fever. What was the second one? Medieval Head. I think Medieval Head is not the real one. That is correct. Yes. Well done. Yes. <laughs> I, I knew I, I should have got the two, two, 2015 awards because you know the 2014 awards, don't you? Yes, I was, I was actually backstage for most of those. You know what? I'm disappointed in porn titles because porn titles used to be a fun thing where they would slightly alter the title, whereas now they just call it you know whatever the parody is, and say the the porn yeah. parody. So it's Batman, the porn parody, as opposed to Fat yeah. Man or Bat Dick or whatever it would be. They they don't. There's like no effort anymore. There's no effort, and I, I think it's a shame. I think it's a real shame. It's a loss. Look and look. I've been asking this one. I asked the SGU guys. It's the big skeptical question. A lot of people have been talking about Spice Girls or Village People. Oh, Maynard, that that might be one of the most difficult questions you've ever asked me. Mm. Oh, my gosh. Because it, it pulls at different areas of the psyche. It, it pulls at many things, yeah. It, it, <laughs> I, oh, my gosh. I. Oh. I, all right. Solely because of the vanguard, I would have to say village people. Because they, they, were, they were first... They were I, they were first, so I, I think they get they get half a point extra. But boy, that's a that's a really good one. That's well, a really good one. Well, look, I'll, I'll go now. Could you just uh, give a, a cheerio to all the bunga bunga listeners out there? Yes, all you bunga bunga listeners, make sure your bungas are packed in your overhead compartment because things may shuffle while bunga ing. Look, I'm very glad to be able to talk to Mr. Dick Smith, and I spoke to you at TAM Australia, and yep. it's great to have a chat to you again. I'm a bit disappointed. You haven't been demonised in the press lately. You've been letting the side down a bit, Dick. Yes, it is a bit. I don't know what's happening. I'll have to stir up a little bit with them. Maybe I'm all on side with them now. Look, I certainly enjoyed your talk again. Well, last time I spoke to you, you were talking about population control, and we agreed then that no one even wants to raise it. Has anything changed? No, well, first of all, I'm certainly not into population control, oh, I'm sorry. but I'm very interested in into living in balance and I think that we should stabilise our population Australia we have about 23 million now, sounds to me about 25 million would be pretty good mm. but the rate we're going we could have 100 million at the end of this century when our grandkids will still be alive and not many people think that's a sensible number for Australia Now I, it was, I thought of you the other day when the UN was talking about the world population will grow by about another billion and they reckon it'll stabilise at that, do you think that that's possible well, or not? It's, it's amazing the UN said two different things. One is it could stabilise about 10 billion. The other, the latest figures show that it could go up to 12 or 14 billion. Mm. And that's going to be just completely not sustainable. At the present time, we use about one and a half times the world's resources every year. And uh, as the the people who are on basically $5 a day, as they raise their standard of living, which they should be allowed to, in fact, it's impossible to have the whole 10 billion people on this earth which it will be in 2060, to have them living on the standard of material standard of living that we have in Australia or America or Europe, that would be impossible. There simply wouldn't be enough resources. In fact, the only reason 
we can have 7 billion now is because 2 or 3 billion basically live at subsistence levels. Look, and I think it's right you said in your talk that because you've someone that's benefited from growth and you've made money out of it, who better than to talk about the perils of it than someone that has benefited from it? Yeah, here's the thing that uh, whilst I've benefited from growth, I have a concern about my grandchildren who uh, will, I think, be living near the limits to growth. And I think we should be planning now to live in balance. Just about everything in nature lives in balance. Uh, Cancer cells don't live in balance, but they normally grow exponentially and then kill their host. I don't think we'd like to be linked with those. Uh, Maybe locusts don't live in balance. Their form of nature is to breed in billions and then die of starvation in billions. It would be terrible if humans are that stupid that we have to follow the locusts Mm. rather than just about everything else in nature which lives in balance. Of course, when you talk about this, we think of the Chinese having to oppose things upon people, and it would be good if we could get people to do it of their free will. What is the way, best way to do that? Oh, it, there's yeah. no problem. It's just yeah. to educate people. Once you educate people, population growth drops. In fact, in Australia, we have our population from births and deaths is about level, but uh, we have this enormous immigration rate. And if you look at countries like Italy... Uh, most developed countries, certainly Japan, their population is actually decreasing. Yeah, Japan's kind of stable at the moment, aren't they? Oh, no, it's, it's going from 120 million. By 2050, it'll be 90 million. Right. Now, all the economists are saying, isn't this a disaster? I'm saying it's not a disaster. It shows that Japanese women are sensible. There's no birth control there. In fact, uh, Japan has a $20,000 baby bonus, a lot more than our $2,000. And even with a $20,000 baby bonus, Japanese women are sensible and not having too many kids. They know Japan's a small country and won't be able to feed 120 million people. (laughs) And how do you think we can get this on the political agenda, agenda, even just to talk about it? And we only want to talk about it, but as soon as we start to talk about it, people go, oh, you don't like the immigrants or whatever race they are, and that's just not what it's about. You're absolutely right. No, it's almost impossible because our whole economic system requires perpetual growth. It's a type of Ponzi scheme. And uh, to try and get a politician who'd be game enough to doubt growth, first of all, I'd be attacked by the media, all of the big capitalistic companies. But one day, what I'm disappointed about is the universities, that they're not teaching people that you can't have perpetual growth in a finite world and we should be developing a system and that's where we need the most educated people developing an economic system that can live in balance. Mm. And Dick you are going now I won't keep you any longer I like asking this question if there was one form of woo that was actually real either talking to the dead telekinesis psychic ability what would be the one you think that'd be good? I think I'd love to travel forward and backwards in time. People believe you can do that, don't they? They certainly do. Is there anywhere you'd like to visit in particular? Uh, I'd like. I think I'd like to go back and see some of the times, the 20s and 30s. I'd love to be an aviator before all the aviation records were broken. I'd like to be born a couple of years before Kingsford Smith and try and fly the uh, Pacific before he did. Wow, that's pretty dangerous stuff, but, you know. know. Well, then again, um, and I suppose I would probably have to die because history shows that no one succeeded before he did. That's true. (laughs) Dick Smith, thank you very much, and thank you for your work on the scepticism today. Wonderful to talk to you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. On Maynard.com.au It's a holiday in Cambodia Where people dress in black It's a holiday in Cambodia Where you'll kiss to a short crack Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank you. Hello, this is Weird Al Yankovic with Maynard. This Christmas, I'll be smearing every square inch of my body with boysenberry yogurt, getting ready for that festive holiday season. JJ is a man who has rebooted the Star Mm. Trek movie franchise very successfully. It's almost like, why not just give him Doctor Who and be done with it? That's true. Give him Doctor Who. He could probably reboot the magic roundabout. Just imagine what Zebedee he'd come up with. (laughs) Merry Shatmus. Oh, thank you very much. A merry Shatmus to, to you all, in fact. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the Feast of Stephen. When the snow lay round about, deep and crisp and even. 
on maynard.com.au. AU! Welcome to A Week in Science from RIOZ, bringing you the science you need to know. MSG is often demonised as an unhealthy or dangerous additive to food. But is it really, or have we all just been taken in by a myth? Why are so many people convinced that MSG can be dangerous to our health? The story traces back to 1968, when a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine attributed symptoms such as numbness, flushing, palpitations and sweating to Chinese restaurant food. The story was then universally popularised in 1972 when Hollywood star Lorne Green collapsed on exiting a Chinese restaurant. When explaining the incident to the New York Times, he said, The food was goddamn delicious, but filled with monosodium glutamate. And that is how the myth was born. Despite this, and many claims against MSG since 1972, extensive scientific research has failed to demonstrate any link between MSG and adverse human reactions. But while MSG is often considered a food additive, glutamates occur naturally in fresh foods and are eaten extensively by all cultures, playing an important role in our nutrition. Glutamic acid is converted to glutamate once in the human body and plays an important role as a neurotransmitter and as an antioxidant. Humans have even evolved a palate to detect the presence of glutamates in our food, hence the savoury response, and as a way to maintain a balanced diet. In fact, if the developed world swapped table salt for MSG, the reduction in sodium intake would prevent tens of thousands of strokes and heart attacks each year. And now, Four fast facts about MSG. MSG was discovered in 1908 by Japanese scientist Kakune Ikeda, who found the naturally occurring crystalline compound created a delicious, meaty and savoury flavour in food. Foods naturally high in glutamic acid include parmesan cheese, peas, mushrooms, tomatoes, Vegemite and human breast milk. We have taste buds for umami, and so it is considered the fifth taste alongside sweet, salty, acid and bitter. And even though umami and MSG are one and the same, no one has ever reported a case of umami poisoning. That's it for This Week in Science. For more information on MSG, go to the RIOS website, riaus.org.au. Follow us on Twitter at RIOS and like us on Facebook. I'm Tania Meyer and we'll catch you back here next week. Hey, this is Jay Novella from the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast. Did you know that there are thousands of skeptical reports, interviews, and investigations going back to 1981 free to download? Just visit www.skeptics.com.au click the publications link and enjoy almost every back issue of The Skeptic, the journal from Australian skeptics. You can also subscribe online and get the latest digital or hard copy of this, the world's second oldest skeptical magazine. That's www.skeptics.com.au or just Google Australian skeptics. We want is some more evidence, please. Here's Joe Alabaster. Hello, this is Joe Alabaster. A couple of weeks ago, I left you at the end of Saturday's talks at the Australian Skeptics National Convention 2014. But the end of the talks was nowhere near the end of the day. Saturday night was the convention dinner. The food was lovely, the company fantastic, and the entertainment, I loved it. We were treated to a show from magician and comedian Nicholas the Honest Conman Johnson, who demonstrated some street cons, card counting, and, in reference to faith healer John of God's psychic surgery, performed the blockhead trick, a nail hammered into the nose. Now, Personally, I'm a huge fan of sideshow acts and stage magic, so I had a great time. Next up was the SGU auction. 
Lucky Bidders won posters, Coffee with Novellas, or Novelle, attendance at a special SGU recording, and a song written on the spot by George Harab. I tried to make a sensible decision and headed back to my kind host Mochuk's house after the dinner, only to spend a few hours sitting up and chatting with her. Whoops. The first talk on Sunday morning was from Peter Ashworth who cheerfully looked out over the audience and noted that she'd scored the hangover session. There were plenty of us who'd managed to haul ourselves out of bed and get to the convention centre, but I suspect that a few of us were looking a little worse for wear. Peter spoke about the politics of discussing climate change in Australia, noting how few climate scientists are involved in public discourse on the topic. Next up was one of my favourites, Peter Hadfield, who spoke about techniques used to edit interviews, in particular for television. Peter Hadfield is a journalist and author who has worked for the ABC, BBC, CBC and New Scientist, to name a few, and runs a YouTube channel under the handle Potholer54, on which he publishes videos he's created, which explain scientific concepts and debunk unscientific claims. Now, overhearing these videos was actually one of the reasons I became interested in scepticism, alongside an appreciation of stage magic and astonishment that anti-vaccinationists actually existed. So I was very keen to hear him speak and perhaps say hello to him later. Incidentally, that's one of my favourite aspects about conventions such as these, being able to meet and chat with some of the speakers. It's lovely being able to give feedback to people whose work you've appreciated, and I enjoyed chatting with several of the speakers during the convention. Peter Hadfield's talk was excellent, providing some wonderful tools for sceptics, and ideally the wider community, to use when reading quotes or listening to or watching interviews. Some of these are covered in his YouTube videos on TV Tricks of the Trade, Quotes and Cutaways, which can be found on his YouTube channel, Potholer54, or by Googling. The next talk was by Dr Bronwyn Hemsley, a senior lecturer in speech pathology at the University of Newcastle on facilitated communication, an appraisal of the evidence relating to authorship. Bronwyn spoke on issues related to ways in which people with difficulties communicating via speech are able to communicate otherwise, utilising technology, assistance and combinations thereof and of troubles which have arisen in situations where human error has affected facilitated communication. Then Michael Marshall took us through some of his experiences in dealing with pseudoscientific and bizarre claims in the United Kingdom. His stories and explanations of his approach were not only interesting but rather humorous at times, and a few people have mentioned to me that they're feeling inspired to get out and engage with the public as a result. The final talk before lunch was from Dr. Alex Wodak. He's an interesting guy and I was very pleased to see that he was scheduled to speak at the convention. Dr. Wodak is a physician, has been a director of the Alcohol and Drug Service St. Vincent Hospital and is president of the Australian Drug Law Reform Foundation. Dr. Wodak spoke on evidence-based harm minimisation related to drug use. His positions have been regarded as controversial as evidence suggests that prohibition of substances is a poor way to reduce risks for those who use them. If this is a subject which interests you, he's written a few articles which can be found via Google. After lunch, the folks from the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe held another live recording, joined by George Harab, which was interrupted by a very special guest to the convention, Mr. James Randi, who had just flown into the country for his Honest Liar tour across Australia. It was absolutely delightful to see him and a wonderful surprise. I'm very glad that he was able to find time in his schedule to come along and say hello. He stayed with the SGU panel for a little while before heading off, receiving a standing ovation from the audience. Following SGU was author and historian Peter Fitzsimons, whose topic was Gallipoli. But straight from the airport and without his notes, he delivered an energetic and professional on-the-fly talk, which also included many stories from his own life and discussed his personal philosophies. Peter Fitzsimons holds the honour of being the second speaker at the convention to cause a few tears from the audience. 
leading me to wonder whether we ought to challenge the stereotype that sceptics tend to resemble Vulcans. After a break, Dr Grant Hill Cawthorn, a medical microbiologist and lecturer in communicable disease epidemiology, giving us some timely facts on Ebola virus in the wake of many myths surrounding the current outbreak. Then Adam van Langenberg, high school teacher and past winner of the Fred Thornett Award, who spoke on the sceptic group he runs at the high school he teaches at and the website of resources for students he's put together to assist others who might want to address scepticism and critical thinking in schools. The website can be found at skepticschool.com and it's amazing. I'm echoing a sentiment I heard repeated many times after his talk. I wish there'd been a teacher at my high school like Mr V. He's engaging, humorous and a lot of fun. The last talk of the day and of the convention was from Dr Stephen Novella who talked about ways in which we as sceptics conduct ourselves when we engage with those who don't necessarily agree with our position. Now I can't do the nuances of his talk justice. He spoke of the value of civility and politeness, the traps we can fall into when picking out logical fallacies rather than hearing the essence and conclusion of an argument. He spoke about fairness, about viewing others in a charitable manner and behaving like an adult, about being patient, but realising that there's a point at which it's appropriate to disengage. He did this with great skill and managed to address these points in a manner which was modest and non-authoritarian. I've enjoyed Steve Novella's writing on science-based medicine for a long while now, and I enjoyed the tone of his speech similarly. It was a great way to round off the day's talks. The convention concluded with the announcement everyone was waiting for. Brisbane will be hosting the Australian Skeptics National Convention 2015. And this I'm really excited about. Brisbane Skeptic Society did such a fantastic job running their first Skeptic Camp in 2014. They've got a great group of people on their organising committee who I think will put on a fantastic event. Well, they'll be holding it a little earlier in the year than previous conventions have been, so lock in the 16th to the 18th of October 2015. News is they've already booked their headline speaker, Nobel Laureate Brian Schmidt. You can stay up to date on convention news by signing up for the Australian Skeptics National Convention 2015 event on Facebook, checking out the website at convention.brisbaneskeptics.org or following the Twitter account OzSkepcon, that's A-U-S-K-E-P-C-O-N. And of course we'll be keeping you up to date with news as it comes to hand here on the Skeptic Zone. There was one more event associated with the 2014 convention here in Sydney, a last-minute live performance by George Harab late Sunday evening at a nearby hotel and then drinks at a pub near, for those of us who weren't ready for the con to end. I had an absolutely fantastic time at both, and during the entire convention. I was ready to sleep for days once I got home, but I love that we can pack so much into one weekend. Again, I'd like to thank Dr. Bob's Trivia Quiz for sponsorship of the Skeptic Zone, which allowed me to attend the convention. Thank you! I'd also like to thank the covert group of listeners who passed a hat around to ensure I had a ticket to the dinner event. Should my investigative skills fail me and I don't end up working out who you all are, know that you have my utmost gratitude. As it's the end of the year, I'd also like to take this opportunity to give a few more thanks. It's been a year since my first appearance on the Skeptic Zone when Maynard approached me with his microphone and asked me a few questions at last year's Australian Skeptics National Convention. Now here's a bit of a secret. I'd noticed Maynard in the crowd conducting interviews and I'd actually been hiding from him as I was painfully shy, very much convinced that I'd make an utter Twitter myself and I couldn't bear the idea of having my voice recorded. I was quite certain that I was limited to blogging when it came to communicating information and perspectives relating to scepticism. Which is silly and probably rather irrational, but there you have it. It took a bit of a leap of faith, a well-timed opportunity and a bit of a push to begin to convince me otherwise. I've been reporting for the show since April and I'd like to thank you, the listeners, for giving me your time, patience and support, especially those of you who have offered me feedback as I've gotten my head around podcasting. I hope that I've entertained you and perhaps offered you something to think about from time to time. 
A special thank you to those of you I've met in person over the past year. I really appreciate the friendliness and encouragement that you've shown me. Also thank you to my family who have rearranged our schedules many times over to enable me to attend events and write and record reports, and who have giggled at my voice along with me. Finally, I owe a serious debt of gratitude to Richard, who took a chance on me, has taught me a great deal, and has given me some amazing opportunities. Thank you, Richard. I'm very glad to be on The Zone and look forward to continuing Evidence Please in 2015. In a world where the truth is a matter of opinion, where messages are received from beyond the grave, And reason is sidelined for magical thinking. Only three men stand between the truth and a postmodernist abyss. What date is it? Seventh, eighth, seventh, eighth? Uh, this is impressive. Uh, it's, it's, are these artist impressions? They're not. They're photographs uh, of Chinese lanterns. It's not. It's not. <laughs> we are not well researched. Yeah, because uh, good God, we're full. We of don't it. discuss cryptozoology on this show very often. Because we don't know anything about it. That's true, that is um, true. The price gets lower and lower and lower, and then he hits a ceiling? It's a ceiling from the room below. <laughs> Skeptics with a K from the Merseyside Skeptic Society. Find us on iTunes. Or, you know, don't. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. And thank you to those people who wrote in and saying how much they enjoyed. Heidi Robinson from the Northern Rivers Vaccination Supporters Group, her report on last week's episode about raw milk. Would anybody really bathe in raw milk? I mean, why would you bathe in milk? Imagine you're sitting in the tub, you get in and it's like milk. Will you put chocolate in there or a bit of coffee maybe? Maybe you can bathe in a chocolate milkshake. It boggles the mind. Her report on raw milk certainly was uh, thought-provoking. And I thought a very good report indeed. Thank you, Heidi. I, I hope we can hear more from you in 2015. And before I go, thank you to all those people who subscribe to The Skeptic Zone uh, via PayPal at skepticzone.tv. Less than a dollar a week. Some people a bit more than a dollar a week. Uh, it's all appreciated, and it all goes to good use. In fact, in fact, pretty soon I might have to be buying a microphone for somebody. I'll let you know. I'll let you know. But until next week, this is Richard Saunders, signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for comments, contacts and extra video reports. Despite stories of kings, relish the things that you give and are given. Every time this time of year, I explain in ways plain and clear. To my relief, I have no belief in the reason 
for the season But I'm one who defends If these means to these ends Result in smiling friends Who once were strangers Where's the danger? I don't believe in Christmas But I love it anyway Every time this time of year I voice a voice some don't hold dear And proudly shout despite my doubt Season's greetings at family meetings And I still can enjoy Like when I was a boy Unwrapping every toy that I get And each one I'm giving This is living I don't believe in Christmas But I love it anyway The best of intentions Never equal the gifts that you got With a season so perfect I'll forgive that its reason is not time this time of year I love the love both far and near and wonder if it matters one bit why we're nicer please be nicer just be nicer. 